I have a final question for the panel, and, and it's something actually that Peter mentioned to me before we walked in today, and, it, and it's, it's something I had written down anyway, so I think we could, starting with you, Chuck, tackle this, which is, you know, we've all been at these conferences before. We've all probably had a hand in writing reports like this before, and we can probably all point to that dusty spot on our shelves where the reports live today. So we have a goal here. We have a destination, 2025, 15 years from now. We're not talking about doing this overnight. What has to happen between now and 2025 so that when we pick up this report then, we'll say, ah, we were visionary, not silly? Well, there's a couple things that kind of as a lead in to the response. I mean, I'm, this is year 38 for me in the public sector, and I've been through a huge number of these efforts off and on, and I've kind of stopped doing them. Um, it's, you know, people have to pull me out of my office to go do these kind of efforts anymore because of exactly that issue. The thing that was different about the Johnson Foundation and about this effort was the people you have sitting up here. That it, it appeared to me that we really had the right people in the room, whether it be industry or whether it be agriculture or whether it be NGOs or whether it be government, that had an interest in starting to move forward on a solution. And usually in these, it was back to Patrick's point, there was usually three to five reports that would come out of every one of the, the <laughs> activities that was in. There would be a majority report, report that may have been one person more than everybody else, and then there would be three to four minority reports for all the other interests in the room. This is different. Um, I think this gives us a foundation for moving forward. And so if I look to 2025, how do we make this work? Well, to, we consider today as the beginning rather than the end of a process, that it's a beginning of laying this issue out, that the Johnson Foundation and others stay involved in this, that we build on the relationships we've set up so far, that we start expanding those relationships with all the people that we know in our industries, uh, and that we treat this in a different way than we always had before. I'll, all of us have committed to doing things independently anyway. Um, even if we can't get the federal government to change, even if we don't get systems changed, even if we still have challenges with state and local government, we all made a series of commitments to move forward on this. And I think those commitments in themselves will make some change. It won't make the change we want, all the change we want. John Airman. I guess my single thought on that is I think there's a chance of making the kind of difference in 2025 if people up here and people in the room uh, have the guts to lead and to break through what I think is an increasing tendency to try to read political trends or trends of in human behavior inertia and say this is impossible so we're not going to try. And I think um, this group Again, I agree with what Chuck said, it's the beginning, not the end, uh, but it starts with this kind of commitment and standing up and be publicly accountable, um, and if people can sustain that, there's a chance to make a difference. Cecilia Estolano. Um, we need to build enduring, unlikely alliances around specific endeavors. Um, so one is data collection, other things. I mean, I could say just one uh, off, the, off the bat is to build an enduring, unlikely alliance between people of color, low-income people, urban folks in poor and, and you know, not so great communities, and um, financers who can figure out financing mechanisms to get some of these projects done. That's the second part of that unlikely alliance. And business, that's ultimately, these could be contractors, these could be folks like Kohler that are providing the technology and the business solutions. And third is labor. Maybe there's a role for labor to be a part of this. Because at the end of the day, I'll go back to my opening part, we, we're about rebuilding this country's middle class in ways that are environmentally sustainable. And you can't do that without unlikely and enduring alliances of community, business, finance, and labor at some level. And we need to do it around specific projects that we can hold up to the world, the country, as successful models. So in, by 2025, if we don't have a dozen of those around the country, we will definitely not have aligned the federal regulatory scheme and all of this other stuff. We need to come up with really specific examples that those folks can come around and join together and become a strong, powerful advocacy group. And that's how we'll get to 2025 successfully. Peter Glick. Um, it's entirely possible that this could end up as another dusty report. I, I think that would be terrible. Uh, I think it's less likely, in part because I think all the pieces are starting to come into place 
the interest in water now is a lot different than it was 20 years ago. There, there's a lot more awareness of the nature of the water problems, and there's a lot more, uh, there are a lot more success stories about way to move, ways to move forward, and that's the good news. If, if I had been here 25 years ago and said, you know, in, fifth, in 25 years, uh, the United States isn't going to use any more water than it uses today. Our population is going to be bigger, our economy is going to be bigger, but our, our, our water use is going to be level. People would have said, okay, you, you know, you're dreaming. But that, that's the reality. We use no more water today in the United States for everything than we used 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Our water use has leveled off, and our economy has gone up, and our population has gone up, so we're moving in the right direction. So in another 15 years, that's still going to be the case, I'd like to think. And ecosystems will be part of the equation, and communities and these alliances are, are going to be normal. It's going to be normal that groups like this talk at the watershed level, the community level, about, about water. And that we have new technologies that David's going to invent. Um, personally. Uh, personally. <laughs> so, that, so that we can flush our toilets with less water, and I can get my son to take shorter showers, no, more efficient showers. <laughs> that there's going to be new technology and that there's going to be new economics around water. I think those things can happen because they're already happening, but we have to push these commitments. We have to stay committed to the things that we've said we're going to do and we have to make other people do things that they ought to be doing. David Kohler. I am very optimistic that we will make a difference. I think what's required is that all of us who've been part of this continue to act and continue to lead, and importantly, in unison together. And I think that is going to happen, and we're going to make sure that this is a sustained effort, not just you know this month, but this year and beyond, so that we do make a difference. And I think there is great power in uh, what we've done here and all these individual organizations acting together and most importantly the fact that we've created this collaborative approach that's very different from what's happened in the past so i'm i'm quite positive about what's going to happen patrick o'toole you get the last word um when, you, when you're at the end all the, you have too many ideas <laughs> but the the uh the beauty of my life is that i get to look at a cow or a sheep and feel good about the genetic thing that i've done but I also get to look at the river and look at the trout and look at the, um, you know, those benefits too and those healthy systems. And, and what I've learned in my life is that the things that I do right, many times I failed getting to those things. There's a dead lamb or a dead calf or this or that that happens because you learn. And I, and I was going back to our initial discussion about why is it that we're having such a hard time with all the regulatory and Bill Ruckel's house at the meeting and Racine talked about there's always been enough laws. It's just how we implement them. And I think from a federal manager perspective, how do we empower those people to not be afraid of failure so that people can go do the right thing? Because very often the system is so afraid of failure that it, allow, it doesn't allow innovation, doesn't allow the kind of things that we have to do to, to, you know, to reach our goals. I want you to thank our, this terrific panel. And...